Game regulations, permanent regulations. Uh, thank you. Uh, these are, um, we have uh, five permanent regulations that we typically bring out um, in our August commission meeting. And uh, then we decide whether we're going on further with, with some of these. Uh, I'll go through each, each regulation separately in this group. Uh, 115.4-2 is big game general provisions, and it basically covers uh, items uh, like the information that's included on the carcass tag, uh, the, our registration system, including our photo registration procedures, and then how to transfer um, meat to another person. Uh, this regulation was um, revised in 2010 and also 2012, and at this time uh, we've received no comments from the public or from uh, staff members uh, for a need to change this particular regulation, um, and we, we don't have anything scheduled to bring this back before the, the commission. I'll go on to, through all of them, and then we can come back and, and go through each individually. And, and, um, 4 4, this is um, uh, big game legal equipment and taking methods. It's one of our more complex and often uh, controversial regulations that we deal with with big game. And we have specific, uh, the regulation uh, contains items on uh, specific equipment differences uh, for hunting different species of big game. Uh, it has the section on um, uh, bright orange colored clothing, uh, accessory equipment like calls and decoys, shooting hours, uh, even special restrictions like the use of horses or mules to, uh, to drive elk. We've had two items that have come up in the past year, or even before that, uh, one of them, uh, and one that's the uh, transmitter arrow. Uh, this is a, a transmitter device that has, uh, is attached to the arrow. Our current regulation says no electronics attached to the, the bow or arrow. And we do have uh, individuals now that are, are building very small transmitters uh, that uh, attach and rapidly detach from arrows. They're designed to help the, the hunter retrieve uh, a wounded, a mortally wounded animal. Uh, the second item is again coming from the public and it has to do with handguns uh, allowed for big game. Our regulation was written in 1985 and hasn't, has basically remained the same since then and uh, the, the concern is the, from the public is that uh, equipment has changed, new calibers have come on, different uh, bullet characteristics, and we are now precluding um, uh, handguns that are uh, adequate to hunt big game. We are reviewing these, um, uh, uh, staff is reviewing them. Uh, at this time, um, we think that this needs additional um, consideration we, on both of these items. What we are looking for is a, our goal is to develop a comprehensive regulation. We've been attacking this uh, uh, regulation through the years, a piece of equipment at a time. And what we would like to do is to step back uh, look at this particular regulation in a more com comprehensive manner and come back to the, um, the commission with reg uh, recommendations that will be both more comprehensive and simpler, uh, if at all possible. Those are, that's the, the goal. We realize that this is going to be a much more complex task than, than some of our regulations. And so we're uh, looking to uh, bring this back in workshop sessions in October, January, possibly March. And uh, our goal is to have the regulation 
in place for the uh, 2013 season, but uh, not normally we have these regulations completed by the March commission meeting. Uh, this particular one we think will require us to, um, to go through a, a more involved um, review process. Uh, 115.4-6, that describes the boundaries for the uh, firearm deer management units. Um, and it's been in place for uh, a number of years. Uh, we've, we haven't received any um, comments or um, requests from the public or from staff, and, and we uh, have no proposal to bring this regulation back again this year for review. Um, 115.4-11 is the big game and wild turkey permit applications. Um, and again, this was modified uh, recently, a couple of years ago, and we have, um, uh, we've received no uh, comments from the public or from within the department and uh, request for changes in this one. Um, and so we, at this time, we, we do not have any proposal to bring this regulation back to the commission this, for the next year. Uh, 115.4-13 is deer permits, descriptions, and restrictions. And I'll just jump uh, ahead here a little bit. Uh, Senate Bill 314 uh, passed this last legislative session, and it says prior to April 30th, 2013, the Secretary shall develop and implement a combination antlered and antlerless deer permit and adopt rules and regulations for the administration thereof. Um, so we have a, uh, this one we basically have a mandate uh, to uh, come out with a combination permit and uh, this is one that we would need to have uh, completed by March, uh, when our, when our typic, when we typically complete our our permanent regulations on big game. Uh, at this time, we are looking at a couple of options for uh, a combination permit. Um, if and we've looked at the history, uh, uh, optional, an additional permit that would be an optional combination permit uh, has the tendency to, well, it, it adds additional confusion for the um, for hunters on which permit to take and confusion there. It also adds to uh, the complexity of our deer permitting system. And Karen Beard's in the, off, in the audience today. Uh, our current system, we have numerous types of big game permits and we are quite concerned about adding additional ones to that each time we do that it's it, it adds a great deal of complexity to both uh, the permitting and how we explain that to our vendors as well as how we collect harvest information uh, and an alternative to uh, a um, an optional additional optional combination permit is to replace a current permit that we have with a new permit that is now one perm that permit plus it has two tags associated with it and that would not add additional complexity to our permitting system but it would provide additional um, uh, opportunities for people that that uh, obtain that permit we then looked at um, uh, some of the uh, items that we thought were problem areas within deer management. And one of the items that uh, traditionally comes up in uh, meetings is problems associated with uh, non-residents, non-resident uh, leasing of land, and uh, those areas that are leased receiving inadequate harvest of antlerless deer. We think that uh, group of hunters, non-resident uh, hunters, might be uh, a, um, uh, 
a good place to look for a combination permit. Our current permit for non-residents for a uh, whitetail antlerless permit is a, uh, that's a, an additional $50 permit. So we're, um, we, we understand that a lot of the non-residents aren't purchasing that permit because of the, the fee associated with it. So that would be um, one of the items, one of the places we think that we could institute a combination permit uh, that would be basically revenue neutral for the department uh, and also put um, antlerless deer harvest in locations on properties where we think we have uh, the, our greatest problem associated with deer population control. Uh, those are the five permanent regulations. Um, three of them we are currently uh, not proposing to bring back again to the commission. The two that we uh, feel that do need to come back and be reviewed in workshops and then worked up are uh, 115.4-4 on legal equipment, and then finally 115.4-13, uh, which would be the new combination deer permit. Are there any questions or comments from the commission? On the, uh, on the one for the types of equipment, question is, with, you're going to bring this back to us, but can you enlighten me or tell me a little bit about specifically what you're going to do in the review process or what the review process is going to entail? Yeah. Uh, we are, we're looking at a number of, of things. We're looking at what other states are doing, um, and I, I want to rely quite heavily uh, on, on input that I'm going to receive from our law enforcement division uh, as well. Most of this um, on that equipment uh, and the way that is written uh, has to do with the enforcement of, of the regulation. And uh, we, uh, for example, with the handgun uh, portion, our handgun uh, restrictions are based on caliber and length of the cartridge case, items that can be reviewed in the field by the, by the officer, something that can be confirmed. Some of the other states are going with um, regulations that are using foot-pounds of energy which we can't measure in the field. Uh, an other alternative that is out there is to uh, be more uh, broad in the way that we write the regulation. We're writing this and we're trying to preclude people from selecting equipment that we feel is inadequate for big game harvest. Uh, an other approach is to open the, the, the regulation more broadly and allow the hunter to make these types of decisions and then uh, focus the department's effort on education on what is adequate, but allow, allow uh, greater flexibility. So when a new version of a 357 comes out, uh, with different energy ratings or whatever, we, we don't have to go back and review each piece of equipment again, but we can, we can have this as something that is um, um, uh, a much more general and with a broader scope uh, and allow the hunter to make those, those decisions. These are ideas that we have at this time. We, haven't, we have nothing final. Final recommendation. Lauren, on 115.4.4, uh, I'd like for you to look at two things. First of all, implementing the approval of anything that's center fire cartridge and see if that's feasible or not. That's one of the options that we are, we are looking at. That's something that Montana uses. We're going to look at other states. We're going to ask what other states are doing, and then we're also going to rely heavily on, on what our law enforcement 
uh, folks. And the other item on that would be this aero transmitter. I know we've talked about this several times, and that fellow's been here. I don't know if he's here today or not, but you've got his contact information. He's never, we've asked several times, everybody, so you can get one and we can look at it. If we can contact him, see if he wants to get you guys one where you can look at it and give us an honest opinion on what it is, and then we can move forward with it one way or another. Yeah, we will have to move forward. He feels that he will have production capabilities with it by January. He was hoping January. That's another reason we're putting this one into a delayed process compared to uh, 4-13, which we're going to move through at a much faster rate and get through in March. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for Lloyd from the commission? Any questions from the public? Mike? Lloyd, I've got some questions on the uh, combo deer permit. You said, and I realize this is very early, but you said it would be a combination for a buck and a doe. Are you looking at one permit that will say antler deer only? Okay. Yes, it would be. It would be the basically the same permits that we've got. Only we have right now. We have a we have a either sex permit and we have a whitetail antlerless only permit. We would now have a permit that had allowed both of those had a tag for both of them. So it's a permit with two tags associated with it. That somebody could shoot two does with that combo. Yes. Because the first permit was a uh, white tail, or for example, a white tail either sex permit. What are you looking at as far as, as cost? Is this going to get passed on to the to the consumer? Which is getting technically he or what, she's getting two? Where you're asking, we don't have uh, that finalized at all, and that would be something that that we would have to look at. Ideally, I would like to see this uh, come through as something that's revenue neutral for us where the department isn't losing uh, money but also where uh, the public does not feel like they've switched the permit on me just to get more revenue or whatever this this is uh, we've been directed by the legislature to develop a combination permit and the approach will be to uh, to do this where we think the the most important benefit will come from, property-wise, a uh, group of people and property-wise, we think that's probably with the non-resident, that group, uh, rather than allow it too broad and have too large of an impact on antlerless deer, or uh, there can be other types of problems. So right now you're we're looking at it right now. We, we've looked at it in a couple of different places so far. Uh, we've looked at it for non-residents, and we've looked at the number of non-residents. And in the briefing book, we've got some estimates of what we think the harvest would be if that went in. We've also looked at it, for example, make a combo permit as part of the youth permit, where you have a youth permit that's a whitetail either sex any season permit, uh, make that a combo permit that uh, we looked at that we, we looked at some other options uh, that we thought were possibilities first Mike what we're, we're we're trying to do is to make sure that we don't provide a system with uh, additional antlerless permits that uh, will be detrimental to the deer herd we want to, and second, if we can put that harvest, that additional harvest that we feel this permit might generate in the areas where we feel we're having the, the most problems. And the, the problems uh, seem to be associated around these areas that are being leased by non-residents. So we'll put the, the idea was to put the antlerless permits in those people's hands. So would, uh, first of all, this has to be implemented by the 2013 seasons? Yes, it does. Correct. And right now you're not looking at it for the general resident hunter? Not at this time. Right now, though, uh, we are in a, um, uh, 
I shouldn't have said that, Mike. We have not brought this back to a workshop session. We do not have a recommendation at this time. These are but, but uh, that, but still that's a possibility. The possibility is that we will only bring this back for the non-resident okay. in this that's, case. That's all I need. Thank you, Lloyd. Any other questions for Lloyd? Any questions from the commission? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kyle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I see we're supposed to recess at five, so I'll try to be brief on this. Uh, I know Doug Nygren went through this pretty fast last time with you, but you've had this in front of you now for a couple of commission meetings. So um, what we got here on this first page is a list of proposed changes to our, for special length and creel limits to our statewide length and creel limits. Uh, I'd like to remind you, Commission, that uh, we do have 26 reservoirs, approximately 40 state fish and lakes, and roughly 225 uh, community lakes that we manage. And our uh, management biologists are very aggressive in managing those resources to provide better fishing for our uh, angling public. Uh, so from time to time, uh, we need to go in there and tweak some of these regulations. Uh, you've got this full page in front of you, but I'm going to draw your attention to the very last item, Glen Elder Reservoir, on the second page. Uh, I know that was discussed in length at the last commission meeting. Um, Doug mentioned that we were looking at several options to manage the crappie fishery at Glen Elder Reservoir, and I'm here today to tell you that staff will be recommending a change to 20 per day creel limit on crappie at Glen Elder. Next item there, length and creel limits, Coffee County Lake. Our uh, management biologist in that area is working real close with the Wolf Creek nuclear plant employees, and they would like to see some changes in their uh, length and creel limits. And as you can see in front of you there, they want to change the walleye length limit to 21. Smallmouth bass, they want to go to 18. Uh, they want to go to 18 inch minimum on uh, largemouth bass and go to two per day creel on largemouth as well. In addition, uh, they want our regs to reflect that no trout lines or trout lines or set lines will be allowed on uh, Coffee County Lake. Other proposed changes for 2013. Uh, we had, we're looking at better defining what an artificial lure is in the state of Kansas. Uh, with the popularity of the Alabama rig or the so-called umbrella rigs uh, being bought over the counter at Cabela's and Bass Pro and so forth. Uh, what these are, if you're not aware, they're multi, uh, multiple lure attached to one single apparatus, as many as five, maybe six uh, lures on a single apparatus. And staff feels like that uh, apparatus as being sold is illegal in the state of Kansas, so uh, we want to better define that. And I think what we have there in front of you is what we're getting close to settling on as far as legal uh, language. Next one, hand fishing permit. As it stands right now, there is a mandatory questionnaire to be completed by each holder of a hand fishing permit. Uh, we no longer feel like that's uh, needed, so we will be proposing to remove that requirement as well. And Commissioner Marshall, I know you're fairly new here, but in case you don't know, we still got another week of hand fishing season still left, so you still got time to get out there and get your permit. <laughs> Um, pretty good right now with low water everywhere so yeah just a pair of tennis shoes and cut off and get after it and those, last one there is uh, we'd like to provide a couple of extra winter fish fishing opportunities at Great Bandstone Lake and Cherryville City Lake by adding them to the list of uh, new trout stocking locations then on the next page um, the commission, as you well know, approved some wild caught bait regulations for 2012. There were four gaps that were identified that we needed to clean up. And I know Doug Nigren and Jason Geckler kind of tag team. They discussed these four gaps in great detail at the last commission meeting. And there were several questions uh, from the commission at that time. 
and I believe they got them all answered. And I think there was the general feeling was the commission was in favor of uh, what we were trying to do there. Um, the very first gap was that fish can now be, or what could be transported from certain waters. And what we're looking at there is uh, allowing bluegill and green sunfish to be uh, transported from non ANS waters. And I think that will satisfy a great deal of our uh, anglers that are wanting to use uh, bluegill and green sunfish as bait. Second gap, fish cannot be captured in a stream or river and used in the immediate downstream reservoir. We realize that that is not what we intended, so uh, uh, we're, we've got language drafted right now that we spend a lot of great deal of time on, and you're going to be uh, you're going to be able to get a chance to vote on those in October. Um, you can see the solution there, and that's pretty much what we're we're, we're going with. The next one, uh, commercial bait dealers are required to provide receipts, but anglers were not required to provide uh, those receipts when transporting the bait. And we are closing that gap. We are gonna try to close that gap by requiring anglers to carry that receipt um, from a permitted bait dealer. I'm not sure that we're uh, looking at an expiration date at this time or the fact that the commercial bait dealer has to uh, keep copies of that. I don't think so, okay, thanks Chris. The last one was out-of-state bait. Uh, that was a big gap. Uh, out-of-state bait, we're looking at uh, requiring that permit dealer to be in compliance with Kansas commercial bait species and standards. And lastly, it didn't make it in the briefing book, but uh, there was a couple of fellows that uh, got up to speak at the in the evening session, I believe, at the last commission meeting. They were um, catfish tournament angler slash organizers, and uh, they were uh, addressing some concern that they had with um, safety issues they had, so if, uh, with uh, being able to haul live fish off of, non, off of designated aquatic nuisance species waters. For instance, like Milford Reservoir, if they have a catfish tournament uh, based out of the state park, some of those guys would want to go up to the upper end of the reservoir and fish for catfish, and, uh, and they were wanting to be able to haul their live fish to the weigh-in site via vehicle or boat. And we are, we are looking at language to allow that to happen. We think that's, a, that's an okay deal, you know. So they will probably be required to have a official permit. on Each individual tournament angler will have a, the permit that will be issued by the agency, um, and they will be required to carry that with them. So if they're taking the most direct route to the weigh-in site, that, that will be okay. So, do you have any questions? Any questions? Well, presumptively, that'll be handed. Yeah, that, that'd handed be handed out, or the person who's responsible for the tournament mm -hmm. will issue those or hand those out, and those will all be collected at the end of the tournament. Exactly. That's what we're looking at. You know, they usually have a pre-meeting, yeah. and so uh, they will be. That will be discussed at the pre-meeting and handed out at that time. So, are there any other questions? First gap, the, that it indicates fish can be transported from certain waters. I thought that our new rule was fish cannot be transported. Can you elaborate on that first gap? I guess I'm not understanding. Can you help that. me on that, Chris? I, I think that's it's a typo, but it, you know, there was an I, and there's always going to be an issue with private water fishing impoundments, which are difficult. They're statutorily defined. And unless we can convince the legislature to get rid of that definition, uh, we will always have a problem with enforcement uh, related to those. Is that and, what this gap is, though? I thought this gap, isn't this gap from public waters to public waters? No. No? Kevin? Yeah. Get the mic. The point of this would be is that in a non-ANS water, an individual could go and catch bluegill and green sunfish and then transport them to another body of water to be used as bait. So if you had a, a local uh, uh, lake, local community lake that was not an ANS designated water, you could catch bluegill or green sunfish and then take them to the river and use them for bait on your set lines or trot lines or something like that. The, the bluegill and the green sunfish would be uh, recognized. I mean, they're easily recognized in a bait bucket 
and that seemed to be the uh, a couple of species that most anglers were most concerned about using as bait uh, for their catfishing. So the gap is not from private to public, but the species of bluegill and green sunfish, right? Uh, yes, it, it would allow that. As it is now, you 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 can't do you that. couldn't do that. You'd right. have to use them in the <clears throat> water where caught. Right. And the exception would then become for bluegill and green sunfish would be the exception to the rule. Uh, you okay. could move them down. And the water. problem, I think, part of the gap was you could still catch bluegill and green sunfish from a pond, and we had no way to stop them from being moved right. from yeah, private water. From private water. water. From, Tech, and most ponds would be private water by definition, probably. It, it's a complex definition for <laughs> private yeah. water fishing impoundment. <clears throat> so uh, this would allow people, it's, we looked at it and said this is the least amount of risk, but it would be the most beneficial <clears throat> for limbline anglers who were, are currently prohibited. I think it's, I think it's a good, good solution that staff, law enforcement, and biologists can all agree on I think it makes sense. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for Kyle or anybody? Any questions from the public? This will go to vote in October. Yes, that's correct. I guess you're done, Kyle. Well, thank you. That's good. Thank you. Jim? Spring turkey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I do have three staff recommendations that we're going to be workshopping today, but before I get into presenting those, I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on this past spring turkey season because since the last commission meeting, I've had the chance to, to analyze some of our harvest survey data. This past spring, we, we once again had a, a good turkey season across Kansas. Um, there was some variation across the regions, but overall our statewide harvest estimate was a little more than 31,000 birds. That falls right in the ballpark, uh, 30 to 35,000, where we've been over the last six or seven years. Our statewide spring hunt success is, was 60% this past spring. Again, uh, that falls in the ballpark uh, with where we've been over the last five years, between 60 and 65 percent. Kind of on the bottom end of that range a little bit, both for harvest and hunt success. Uh, and that's due to some, some slight reductions in, <clears throat> in population in the central part of the state, either due to drought and or, or heavy rain, depending on which part of the state you're talking about. But overall, it was a pretty good season. Uh, permit sales, again, were, were over 60,000, so they're in the same ballpark with where we've been over the last seven or eight years as well. As far as populations are concerned, uh, over the last several years, we've been concerned about declines in the, the eastern part of the state. Uh, last year, we had quite a bit better reproduction, summer of 2011, than we've had in a while. Uh, numbers were up a little bit this spring, as was hunt success and harvest. Uh, all indications are that, that production in the eastern third of the state was really good this summer. I don't have the final numbers yet, but, but I'm getting reports of, of a lot of poults out there on the ground. So it's looking like things are turning up in the eastern third of the state. Um, the severe drought that we're experiencing in the western half of the state over the last two years has hurt production substantially. It did last year. I don't have the final numbers from this, this uh, summer yet, but I expect to see a downturn uh, in the western part of the state. On to staff recommendations, uh, as I mentioned, we have three. The first is that, that I'm recommending new spring hunt units, and those hunt units are, you can see, depicted on figure three in the briefing book materials, and those hunt units correspond to, with the units that have already been adopted for this coming fall, and I, so several of you remember uh, that we've discussed why that recommendation uh, occurred, and, and that is so that we can better align our, our hunt units with our management units, which will allow us to better use our, our data to guide our, our recommendations in the future. So that's the purpose of that recommendation. Uh, the second one is an increase from one to two birds in, in Unit 1, Northwest Kansas, and that will still be Unit 1, even if the new units are, are adopted. And, and that is due to the fact that we still have increasing turkey populations in that part of the state for the most part, uh, and landowner complaints are on the rise 
So we feel like we can provide more opportunity uh, in, in northwestern Kansas. And thirdly, uh, we want to recommend, or we are recommending, that the Unit 4 draw permits for southwestern Kansas be valid in adjacent units uh, to increase uh, the opportunity of those folks that draw a permit. With that, I'd, I'd stand for, for questions. Any questions for Jim? Jim, you always make it so easy to understand. I give it my best. You do. You really do. <laughs> well, I appreciate so. that. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Linda? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about two topics that uh, will amend our regulation to conform to our new statute passed by the state legislature this past session. The first one is the new park pass regulation, which would make a change to our regulation. Um, this pass we introduced, as you heard Secretary Jennison say, that um, we're trying to look at ways to generate additional revenue in the state parks and to supply our constituent groups to have easy access to our permits. This will allow, when you go to register your vehicle, allow you to purchase a park pass permit or mini park pass permits at that time once you get your re registration. Uh, what this will change is this will add the easy pass vehicle permit into our regulation. It will take away our uh, seasonal pricing so right now, April through September, we have a, a higher cost than October through March. We'll do away with those changes in, in fees there, have the park pass. We will have the annual motor vehicle permit if you choose not to get it through the uh, registration process. That will be a $25 fee at the park office or through the online system that we have. The daily vehicle fee then will go up to $5 at the gate and seniors will still receive their discount if they purchase them, them through the park office. And uh, as the secretary said earlier, we are, we are anticipating some really good sales for this um, with the help of tourism. Are there any questions? Are there any questions from the commission? <coughs> the public? This will be effective in January? January, uh-huh. All right, why don't you go to the next topic? All right, alcohol on KDWPT properties. Again, this was uh, put through to allow us, again, Secretary Jennison talked about the possibility of attracting resorts um, and to free up some competition within our neighbors and the core uh, neighbors to us. And this will allow us to uh, remove the cereal malt beverage restriction and the agency will still be able to post on certain areas uh, no alcohol on, on certain areas. So this will take away the restriction that we have. We do allow 3.2% uh, beverage now, and this will take that restriction away. Are there any questions? Any questions from the commission? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, what will be allowed now? Everything, if, if this is adopted? And we can still make restrictions where we, we deem necessary. We can. We have some restrictions in place already on nope. certain properties. That's not going to change where it's no alcohol. This just takes it from 3-2 to, to, you know, wine or other alcohol okay. on the rest of the properties. Yep. Any questions from the public? Any more questions from the commission? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Kevin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. <clears throat> the uh, proposed regulation I'm going to uh, speak about today uh, is involved with uh, Senate Bill 314. As you know, it was a rather uh, in-depth and comprehensive uh, uh, bill that 
covered uh, quite a number of topics uh, dealing with the agency, and there was quite a number of individuals even here today in the audience that uh, contributed quite a little bit of work to uh, see that the Senate bill was uh, passed through and put into place in law. The particular topic that we're talking about is uh, the provision within this bill that allows <clears throat> for the establishment of true restitution values placed on trophy uh, class animals that were taken in violation of the law. Uh, up to this point in time, we had some broad ga uh, guidelines. We had some values that were placed on uh, wildlife under our uh, uh, law that prohibits uh, commercialization of wildlife, but nothing that really uh, specified restitution values. And uh, this, throughout uh, the years, has been something of, of a little bit of a problem of what do you establish as the value of a particular animal. Uh, in this situation, uh, the regulation will deal with the process in which uh, the uh, score is um, developed or we uh, determine uh, the gross score for a uh, set of antlers or horns, as the case may be, um, and then based upon a formula that would take that gross score measurement uh, minus a constant value for that species. For instance, deer uh, is a... Um, a constant value of 100 that would be de deducted from the gross score. Elk is 200 and antelope is 40. Um, from the number that's derived from that cal uh, calculation, it, that number is squared and then times uh, multiplied by $2 to arrive at the value of that uh, particular uh, animal that has been poached. Uh, in order to uh, come up with the method for developing the gross scoring, uh, we have opted to contact Boone and Crockett, uh, as you're well aware, I'm sure, uh, the notoriety of the Boone and Crockett Club for scoring animals. Uh, it's basically the uh, standard that about everything else is based on when you get to uh, comparing animals for tr trophy um, uh, considerations. Uh, their process is a copyrighted uh, process. They have given us permission to use their uh, system of measurement uh, in our uh, endeavors and have ensured uh, uh, us that they would help us in any way possible to uh, develop uh, the measuring uh, process. Uh, the regulation that will be brought forward uh, details uh, basically that that method of how Boone and Crockett develops a gross score uh, for deer, elk, and antelope. And that would be what we would be basing these measurements on for the calculation of restitution values. I'd stand for questions. I'm just, I'm just looking here. If a if a white tail was scored 125, yes, uh, you would you would square that. Well, you would take 125 minus 100 would give you 25. All right. That's then you would square 25, so 25 times 25 times $2, and that's the value. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying, just trying to figure out what. <laughs> that would be uh, $1,250. Okay. Are there any other questions from the... <laughs> are, there any, are there any are there any other questions uh, from the commission? Any questions from the public? Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. All right, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I'm going to continue the Senate Bill 314 theme. Um, what we're going to talk about here, and it's basically a workshop, a workshop issue, uh, even though this is the first time you've heard it. Um, but as a result of Senate Bill 314, which initially was proposed to eliminate the exemption for resident um, hunters and anglers over the age of uh, 64, the hunting and li uh, fishing license exemption, uh, we came up with... Uh, we did get the exemption, but we are going to be required to provide them with uh, a senior lifetime pass and a half-price fishing and a half-price hunting license and a half or a half-price combination annual fishing and hunting license. 
Um, the way the statute reads, the, the lifetime senior pass, which is a combination license, the price of that cannot exceed uh, one eighth of what the regular lifetime license costs, which is 880 bucks. But I think during the legislative process, staff looked at what it would take um, to ensure uh, federal funds that, that could be uh, collected from that license. And I think the, the, the fee of $40 was discussed uh, throughout that process. The half price for an annual fishing or annual hunting license would be $9. Uh, half price for a combination uh, hunting and fishing annual would be 18. Uh, an annual, a regular uh, annual combination is 36 right now. So with that, I would certainly stand for any questions. Mike, do we know with certainty that uh, this will pass the feds numbers or do we think it probably will well i know the the numbers that we worked with when we when we made this proposal i don't know that those are going to stay I, I would defer to robin on that question mr chairman we do know with certainty that under the current guidelines uh that will qualify us for the uh, senior lifetime pass will qualify us for Pittman robinson dingle johnson for somebody that's 65 and buys it for another 18 years for that individual. The the one thing that did happen, and it was actually the day that the House voted on it, uh, Iowa was going under an audit, and there was some question brought up about their the way that they do it, which is very similar to this. Uh, Iowa had not yet had a chance to respond to the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife's audit uh, don't know where that is at this point, but regardless of that fact, uh, we will be in the same boat with everybody else that's already doing it. So we will still, we will still, we may not get the amount that we anticipated, but because if what we are about to do and a number of other states are already doing is ruled that we can only do it for five or six years uh, rather than the 18 it's still going to put that amount of money that has been heretofore going to other states back in the pot, and we're going to get more of our share, I guess is the best way to answer it. And do we have to provide, uh, do we have to escrow this money? Uh, the, under the current uh, understanding of the way the feds do it now, which is different than what it used to be, you can amortize that out, and that's the kink. Uh, their interpretation before is that we had to make a dollar per license. And, of course, this is a combination license, so that's $2. And you could amortize that out for the cost of your license. So we have $40, could be a little bit of interest. It, it, it very easily meets the criteria that all the other states were working under. Uh, but I will tell you the feds are looking, and I think they ought to. I mean, I, what some of the other states are, were doing I just think was uh, – taking advantage of the situation, and we decided to do the same thing. So uh, I think that it will be looked at. Uh, the other thing that's in this bill that I think is very important, and I'm going to have to uh, ask Chris to make sure I'm right, uh, that portion of the bill sunsets in eight years or ten? Eight years. So in eight years, it, it will be back to where it's fully up to the responsibility of the commission to set license prices. Uh, whether the let so the legislature will not have uh, a part in that, which that became pretty political as you you can imagine. So that was probably the better part of the bill. In eight years, it'll s strictly be up to the commission to set our hunting licenses and who has exemptions. In 1971 is when they reduced it to 65. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? I have one for secretary. Uh, after that eight years is up, then this senior pass is going to continue. It's paid for, and, or will it, it be affected? It would be up to you all. The the, the part, Chris, you want to? You better say that. I may miss it. I think your question is for people who've already purchased it. Correct. Yes. yes. They, it would still be would effective. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the public? All right, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Linda? 
agrotourism. All right. Um, in 2011, as you guys are aware, the Governor Brownback Pat uh, issued Executive Reorganization Order, or ERO number 36. That merged tourism into our agency. Um, one of the things that was unintentionally uh, an unintentional oversight was agritourism, because at the time, agritourism was technically not part of tourism. Um, in 2012, then, a cleanup bill was uh, passed that cleaned up everything that might have been omitted, that brought all the statutes together, that, that brought agritourism into our agency, tourism into our agency, and merged the organization. Um, with agritourism, many people didn't realize that, or some people didn't realize that there are a lot of regulations that go along with that, that defines liability, that defines the registration process, that defines a lot of different things. And so you guys get to learn more than you probably ever wanted to know about agritourism. Um, but that will become your responsibility. We Once the statutes are renumbered and everything is fully cleaned up, we will be presenting those regulations to you for your review and approval probably in January or March of next year. So just for your information. You were working with them directly? Working with who? Uh, who did, Agritourism? Yes. Agritourism has reported since, uh, since the merger, actually, technically it was thought originally that agritourism would move to the Department of Agriculture. It did not align... Um, probably in the best sense in that regard, made more sense for it to come to our organization. So technically, they have been working with our organization and with our team um, since the onset. Regretfully, at this point in time, that position is not filled with the FTE that we had before, so we've assumed that responsibility with the tourism staff that we currently have. Okay. Okay, any questions? Any more questions? Any questions from the, from the audience? All right, thank you, Linda. Well, no, that's pretty good timing. Uh, I believe it's time to recess. Uh, we will reconvene here at 7 o'clock. Uh, thank everyone for, I thank everyone for coming and uh, hope to see you all back here at 7 o'clock.